to open line tonight. Tonight's topic is the death penalty. I'm trying to get everything arranged here on the desk. I'm trying to get involved with our Facebook Live viewers. Thank you for tuning in. If you're watching via Facebook Live, I'm going to try to get some of your comments and questions here in just a second when I get online here. Uh, we are talking about the death penalty. Hannah Cox is my guest tonight with the uh, conservatives, cons conservatives concerned about the death penalty. And I have to look down at my sheet every time <laughs> because it really just doesn't make sense yet because always we have heard Republicans are for the death penalty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're saying there is a there's kind of this groundswell. There's a growing contingency that we're really seeing, and, and it's it's interesting to watch, and you know, not just at legislators with Republican lawmakers taking this on, but in the grassroots as well. Um, I you know was working with Mental Health Coalition on this issue for two years in Tennessee before moving into this position, and I spoke to a lot of Republican groups and conservative groups and libertarian groups across the state, and was always very pleasantly surprised by the mm. reaction that got. I think we've got a lot of thoughtful people who have started to really question this issue and it makes sense when you're talking about people who don't trust the government we don't trust the government to deliver our mail in republican <laughs> circles so why would we trust them to carry out these really um you know heavy sentences of life and death i think that people are starting to recognize it doesn't add up and we were talking before the break about the um the drug cocktail which mm -hmm. has been called into question now for several years and cost a lot of states to put the brakes on executions for several years now mm -hmm. And it just seems to be starting, the states are starting to, pay, or it just seems to begin, the states are starting to pick back up their executions. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing that here in Tennessee, first execution in nine years, scheduled for Thursday. Uh, can you give us the down and dirty on what the argument is against the protocol? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I think the thing that's most compelling to me is a lot of these drugs are saying we don't want our products used in this manner. Yeah. This is not what we developed them for. Developing a drug can take decades and millions of dollars. We did not make this investment to have our products used in this way. That's bad PR. And some of them have actual moral ethical issues with that. Um, we have seen midazolam be especially vocal, or the parent company of midazolam be especially vocal, which is one of the main three drugs typically used in these lethal injection cocktails. They actually were successful in Nevada about two weeks ago. They had filed a lawsuit saying this very thing, that they didn't want their, their product used in this mm -hmm. way, and so a stay was um, issued for that execution because of that. In Tennessee, there's still pending um, litigation going on around these issues, and also concerning whether or not these medications equate to torture. Um, there are some indications that people are not completely anesthetized underneath them and that they might still feel um, sensation. It might actually be equivalent to being drowned. Uh, would be the sensation. And so those are ongoing. I think as a conservative, the compelling thing to me, though, is the freedom of association issue. If, if these companies are saying, we don't want our product used in this way, states should not be trying to circumvent them and, and using secrecy and, and laws to prevent transparency to go around behind their backs and get these drugs. Um, so I think that's upsetting. The other thing I think is upsetting, going back to our correction officials, is when you're talking about someone who's already having to take someone's life and you're dealing with these drugs that are experimental mm -hmm. a lot of the time or that we know have bad results, then that's even more traumatizing for someone who's having to administer this. If you have a botched execution, which has become very frequent, that's terrible for these people who have to then you know, adapt. A lot of them are not used to practicing this because we aren't executing people that much in this country anymore. All of that, I think, is a really big issue within this debate as well. Just to check in with one of our Facebook viewers, Lori wrote on here, she says, I think we need a very clear definition of what mental illness a person can have and how it affects their ability to know right from wrong, as well as ability to control oneself in society. Otherwise, folks claim mental illness when mm -hmm. caught in a crime, but the illness may not be the one that could uh, I'm trying to start, impact the decision making. Yeah, very valid Great point. Question. You don't want everybody saying, "Oh, but wait, I was mentally right. ill. Can't kill me." So. Um, we'll get a little technical here. Okay. Uh, basically, there's an initiative out of the ABA, uh, the American Bar Association, which actually does not take a, pen, a position on the death penalty, but they have taken a position on executing people with severe mental illness, and they're strongly opposed. Um, there has been a movement from that across the uh, country in various states that have been trying to seek an exclusion from the death penalty for people with what we call severe mental illness. And when you're in the mental health community, what that refers to are actual very specific diagnoses in the DSM-5 um, and they are the they call them the big five typically and these are the disorders where someone could have an altered sense of reality so we're not talking about your everyday depression anxiety um, even many personality disorders we're not talking about it's typically things like schizophrenia bipolar disorder with psychosis um, schizoaffective disorder major depressive disorder with psychosis um, and so these are things that 
they are definitionally in this book verified by scientists and doctors disorders that cause people to lose sense of reality um, and that somewhat differs state to state and what mm -hmm. the bill is saying that's I'm referring to Tennessee's bill that has been looking at that in recent years um, but it would all be in this uh, classification of severe which is actually a medical term so interesting I want to talk to you about a, a bill that moved through yet yeah, um, last year in the legislature last mm -hmm. session we'll get to that in just a second but I do want to get to our callers right now Jeff is on the line hi Jeff hey go ahead I just have one question sure um, if you're pro-life then isn't doesn't that cover like all life? No matter like, it, there should not be a death penalty. Period, because you're pro life. Thank you. And I think that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I've always been kind of dumbfounded by this: is that Republicans, conservatives in general, are pro life, mm -hmm. but then in general for the death penalty. And I've always, I'm like, wait, where's the breakdown there? We're talking mm -hmm. about life, right? right? And you're saying more people are kind of coming to this conclusion? Yes, I think, and we're seeing that with the Pope uh, speaking mm -hmm. out, and, and we'll get to his actions in a bit, I'm sure, but his actions this past week and changing the actual catechism of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church addressing uh, its teachings and, and making sure it was no longer ambiguous on this, but very clear cut that there is under no circumstance a time or place where this is appropriate. I would agree with that. I think that's a consistent stance. I think that if you value the sanctity of human life, that life always has meaning. That doesn't stop um, just because someone committed a terrible crime. I think we've seen, you know, many people who have committed very heinous mm -hmm. crimes be reformed and be restored and actually end up contributing greatly to society. Again, I'm not saying I don't think people should be held accountable. I certainly do. But when we're talking about how you feel about the moralness of this issue, we see many conservatives that are starting to say, this doesn't add up, actually. Um, the one pushback we get, and I'll just go ahead and throw it out there, is people say, well, I believe in supporting innocent life. I believe in protecting innocent life. To which my counter would be, we're talking about innocent life here. We're talking about at least 162 innocent lives of people who have, thank God, been found innocent before it was too late and countless others who are probably still there so if you care about innocent life you have to care about this issue because you're playing with it interesting okay let's go to Linda on the line as well hi Linda hi go ahead I have a couple of comments sure. first of all uh, what about the innocent lives that the people who are on death row for taking and mm -hmm. torturing and everything uh, d no one seems to think about them the victims and also, the drug companies that are opposed to their uh, drugs being used for this, they're not opposed to people getting them by prescription and killing them every day, the opioids and such. Yeah, we might be talking about apples and oranges with those drugs. We're yeah. talking about the three drug cocktail there, but I get where you're going with that. But again, to bring it back to the innocent lives, it always has to come first to those. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we said earlier in the show, the people sitting on death row, for the most part, not everybody, because there have been exonerations, for the most part have committed heinous, heinous crimes. The um, execution I witnessed in Kentucky, the last man they executed in the state, killed two young children, a five-year-old and six-year-old, stabbed another one who played dead but ended up living. The mother was raped and stabbed. Two knives were broken off in her. She was able to call, crawl to the neighbors, bang her head on the door because she was bound to get help. I mean, it's just a heinous crime. This man admitted to it, asked for the death penalty, got it, forwent the appeals, and was executed. It was a heinous crime. I was reading about it again today just to refresh myself on it. And I, I, I couldn't read the whole thing. It's mm -hmm. just heinous. I mean, I don't think anybody is disputing that. Right. And sometimes I think the victims do get lost in this because I, we're not talking about that. They absolutely get lost. And like I said earlier, I, I think it's important that we continue to mention their names. Paula Dyer, in this case that we're talking about here in Tennessee, I haven't seen her name mentioned once mm -mm. this whole week. Um, I had to dig for it to find out what her name is. I think that I agree. Where is the justice for them? They're not getting it in the system all their families are getting is drugged through the mud where they have to go in and consistently listen to the worst day of their life happen over and over and over again and while there have been some volunteers I think about 145 out of executions have actually been people that have said I'll forego my appeals mm -hmm. just take me out basically right um, for the most part these people are having to relive this day in and day out for decades and decades and decades they don't get closure it often further divides the families some of who want to pursue it some of whom don't mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of the day there are much better victim services that we could provide people that would actually give them closure, give them justice, and make sure they're getting what they need um, to go on with their lives. And I, I 
think that you know you have to talk about murder victims' families when you're talking about the death penalty. But what's surprising to many people is that a lot of them are with us on this issue. We have a lot of vic uh, victims' family members that work with our organization, that speak at some of our events, and that talk about the firmer the further traumatization that they went through going through this system. This system continues to make new victims um, and it does nothing to disrupt cycles of violence. So I think that it's really important to examine um, what they're saying and many of them are saying this was not a, a good system for us either. Interesting. Linda, uh, let's see. Oh. I thought we had Paul on the line. Paul, if you want to call back, feel free to do so. Just some really interesting comments on Facebook. Thank you to our Facebook Live viewers. A great conversation that's going on here. Um, uh, it, James brings up the point about paying. It says, no, the taxpayer has to pay for them for years and years and years and years. So if you can go back and describe what is the breakdown on payment, let's say for keeping somebody in prison mm -hmm. for 50, 60, 70 years, if they committed this crime as a young adult, it compared to executing them, which yeah. often does take a decade or two. Right, so I do want to say that you, the taxpayers, are paying far more money under the death penalty system than you would be paying for these people were you to pursue sentences like life in prison without parole or life in prison. The reason for that being that death penalty cases are about a million to two million dollars more per case, and then over the years we see that continue to add up. Um, you have to add in the cost of when it's pursued and, and a sentence is not reached, and also when it's pursued and the execution does not end up happening. That breaks down differently state by state and we don't always have great cost studies because frankly it's very expensive to produce cost studies and also a lot of states don't want that information out there so there's mm -hmm. not a lot of incentive to. Uh, so Tennessee doesn't have a lot of information on this. We do have a pretty good report um, from Justin Wilson's office that kind of gets into the overall areas but to look at other states that have produced that, it would be North Carolina, Florida, California, and some of the interesting data we're seeing um, in Florida, for example, they end up spending about $24 million per execution. Wow. That's about $51 million a year they spend on the death penalty alone. Um, North Carolina's cost studies showed that for states that do pursue the death penalty, they spend about $2.16 million more per execution than they would on another sentence. Um, and that most states who have the death penalty spend in excess of $11 million a year, which if you break that down, uh, and you have a police officer who's paid $40,000 a year, that's an additional 250 police officers a year. <laughs> so it is a drastically more expensive system. Um, and I know many people would say, well, cut the appellate process. Well, that say, doesn't solve it. Just like Mark here says, well, just take them out after the trial, fry them, hang them, do what you got to do. You cut that price. Doesn't cut your price. Most of the costs for a death penalty are incurred at the trial level. You do see 70% of those costs come about then. And in fact, when they've showed other studies where plea deals have been entered, it shows that even just suggesting the death penalty, Penalty. The minute it's on the table, the costs start adding up and it becomes more expensive than life without parole even then. So this is not something where you can cut the appellate process short and I really would hope people would not go to that considering how right. many people have been found innocent to begin with. But if that is where you go and you don't care about innocent lives, you know, perhaps being lost in the shuffle, you're still not saving money. You're mm -hmm. still actually paying a lot more money to pursue a death penalty for someone. And on top of that, the opportunity costs, I just think, are staggering to me when we're talking about 51% uh, of people who never have their murder caught. That's staggering. That's not something that's a small matter, um, and I don't think it's worth it to continue to waste these resources. And in fact, neither do police. We have studies from police. There was a really great study done in 2009 that surveyed chiefs of police where they ranked the death penalty the least effective tool in their really? arsenal. And 61% uh, of them said that they thought it was mostly for politicians to look tough on crime. Um. Uh, and while they might support it, in theory, it was not working in practice and was not helpful for them and that they would rather have that money used for resources that actually would deter crime. Uh, and these are preventative things like mental health courts and, and drug um, courts when you have someone who's first encountering the, the criminal justice system. You know, most people don't go and commit a murder who have never encountered the criminal justice system. Right. There's usually a buildup for quite some time that we are not catching it's and addressing the root causes of mm -hmm. crime early on. We let it escalate and then spend a lot of money trying to punish someone versus trying to redirect our resources and actually prevent crime and make our community safer. Unfortunately, it's not like a black and white thing, lights on, lights off. This is mm -hmm. a, you just got to turn the system upside down and change it. Exactly. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of trial and error mm -hmm. and just years to show results. That's exactly we right. have to take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about a uh, proposal in the last legislative session and tell you about that and how it failed. All right, coming right back. <laughs> 